hey, someone's gonna do it. I think anyone over the age of like 10 knows the deal with licensed games. They're a mixed bag. Everything falls on this massive spectrum, somewhere between the top with Spider-Man and Star Wars The Old Republic and the very, very bottom with the Flintstones for the Master System. Not everything can be as good as CG Wolverine's arm hair or as bad as uh, whatever I'm looking at. So now for the licensed game flavor of the week, Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Z, GT, Super. This classic anime shonen series has gotten an onslaught of video games dating all the way back to the mid 80s with Dragon Ball Dragon Daihikyo on the Super Cassette Vision. Yeah, I'm sure there's like one person who knows that. We're no stranger to Dragon Ball on this channel. We've covered at least 10 of these things, be they good, bad, middle of the road, or excellent, but I've yet to cover something so polarizing. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot came out at the very beginning of 2020, and for one that allegedly sold over 2 million copies, it totally seems to have gone in one ear and out the other. Then it somehow gets a season pass that was seemingly delayed all the way to June 2021. Then that's not even mentioning the free multiple updates, one of which including a complete standalone trading card game. Yeah, there's clearly a lot to get into, so I went the distance. 100% all DLC completed, most character levels maxed out, all trophies, every side quest, every soul emblem leveled up, and a lot of stuff beyond the typical platinum trophy run. My PlayStation 5 says I played 66 hours, which is so much more than anyone should play of this game, but I did it. A game with infinite potential and one that ultimately, well, we'll save it for the end. So yo, it's Austin, and today I'm gonna be talking about Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, the DLC, everything. Recently, I've been enjoying the deep dive, and if my Bell and Wonderful video is anything to go off of, I think that you guys probably do as well. So I figured, hey, I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, let's do it. There's no sponsor today, so if you guys like the video and wanna support me, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Austin Eruption, or buy one of my t-shirts at the Pixel Empire. It's all greatly appreciated, and all the money goes back into this channel and making me more of a gremlin for you guys. Is that good? Is that bad? You decide. So with all that out of the way, let's get into it. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. This one's been a long time coming. Kakarot was one of those releases that I bought day one, but immediately forgot about. Like many others raised by Toonami and general television, Dragon Ball Z was one of several pillars of my childhood that's left a lasting impression. And because Outlaw Star didn't last for 30 years, Dragon Ball Z is what we're talking about today. That being said, nine out of 10 licensed anime games end up one of three ways. 1v1 fighting games, 2D platformers if you're older, or of course, a mobile gacha game. The worst fate. Dragon Ball was lucky enough to have some quirky card games, side-scrolling beat-em-ups, and of course, the one everyone remembers, the Legacy of Goku trilogy on the Game Boy Advance. I already talked about these, so you can check those out in this video later. So flashback to 2019, and Bandai Namco shows off a trailer for a brand new game they're working on, tentatively titled a Dragon Ball Game Project Z Action RPG. Sick name, I know. A trailer featuring high-budget cutscenes that really took parts of the anime and manga and made them shine. But also also one with a little credit at the end that featured a familiar developer, CyberConnect2. CyberConnect2 gets a different reaction depending on who you ask. These are the folk that are responsible for the Dot .hack franchise, a series that was one of the first to dive into the if you die in the game, you die in real life concepts. They're the people behind the cult hit Asura's Wrath. They're also the ones who created Tail Concerto, Sola Tarobo, Red the Hunter, and Fuga Melodies of Steel, three super unique games that have gone under the radar. But you probably know them for Naruto. Naruto. Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm, 1, 2, 3, 4, Nar Narts. Narts everywhere. Bandai Namco kind of turned them into a licensed anime fighter factory over time, and they've kept really busy doing, well, mostly that. That was until they got themselves a huge job by the name of, oh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. That's right, for those who remember, Remake was in development for a long, long time, with their version of it being shown in 2015. Then, no news for a while. 2017 comes around and CyberConnect2 is terminated from the project, with Square Enix abandoning all of their work to start fresh. That's uh, never a good sign. That left CC2 with a near three year gap in releases between the .hack HD remaster and Kakarot, the longest in their history. So it seems like in a lot of ways, this Project Z was gonna be the comeback. CyberConnect's return to form after an unintentional hiatus. To be given the keys to one of the most in-demand franchises of all time and set up to recreate the story of Goku and video 
video game form was not an easy task, but it's also something that had unfortunately been done countless times at this point. Let's move forward again to June 2019 at the Xbox E3 conference, another trailer, this time showing way more over the top cutscenes. By the way, if you know anything about CyberConnect as a company, it's that they make damn good cinematics. Whoever's over there directing cinematography, give them a raise. In fact, give them two raises. This is when Project Z became Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, a game that promised to tell the entire story of Goku as an action RPG, one that got not just approval from, but a serious endorsement from series creator Akira Toriyama stating it'll include backstories that haven't been told in the manga. Finally, someone remembered launch. So over the next half year, a bunch of info and media started trickling out with the gameplay, showing Kakarot looking kind of similar to Dragon Ball Xenoverse or any of the basically yearly Dragon Ball releases, and suddenly Kakarot was looking a lot less unique. No one's got anything on those signature CyberConnect cutscenes, but their gameplay has always been a style over substance deal. Flash forward to January 2020, and Kakarot comes out with an extremely tight review embargo that delayed thorough reviews until several days past its release. Well, it reviewed in the mid sevens, and any notoriety seems to peter it off within a week of it coming out. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot was something everyone treated as simply a product as opposed to an experience. The next one up on the endless assembly line of Dragon Ball games. A recognizable franchise with nearly 60 million sales. This is why Bethesda keeps re-releasing Skyrim. They, they're barely staying ahead. Kakarot pretty much has everything working against it. Middling reviews, a super tight review embargo, and the fact that it's another game in the Dragon Ball Z franchise, one that has had like two games coming out every year up until this point. Fighters is still pretty popular, and that's like two years older, but that game isn't a 3D version of Legacy of Goku. Kakarot opens like any modern video game, with a privacy policy and endless notifications. Time Machine, Villainous Mira, Steak, DLC, Card Warriors? What? After a brief control tutorial where you play as Goku daydreaming about Piccolo, you get to do something exclusive to this game and role play as a dad. And by that I mean an escort mission where you have to slowly walk next to Gohan for a really long time. Safe to say he couldn't have gone that far. Granted, you could just jump away and run off, completely ruin the scene, and that might be more accurate to the source material, but there's a cute moment here that you just don't get to see anywhere else. Dad vibes. From here, you, well, get to do the whole Dragon Ball Z thing. As far as structure goes, Kakarot is very similar to Legacy of Goku in that you follow the main story beats of Dragon Ball while also exploring and doing little side quests here and there. The biggest difference, of course, being that Legacy is faithful to the English dub in its presentation and Kakarot's got that uh, big budget thing going on. Weirdly though, there's a huge gap in the quality from time to time in the presentation. As you see during the introduction, we have these amazingly choreographed cutscenes that really enhance the anime as a whole. Then, like an old school Final Fantasy CG, you'll get yoinked back to reality and be looking at weird awkward dialogue exchanges that seem like two generations behind. Now I'm not asking for it to look 10 out of 10 all the time, but maybe Vegeta's head should be moving even like a little bit. This type of cutscene is the way that 90% of this game's story and side quests are presented. Early on, it seems to lean heavily into showing off what they can do to the player, but the further you get into the game, the more basic it looks. But when a big special moment from the show happens, and you know the ones, there's no mercy. You play through the beginning, watch your son get kidnapped, fight off Raditz, promptly die, and then what's next? Snake Way, right? Actually, no. For a game that's called Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, he's not who you play as most of the time. I didn't expect there to be multiple playable characters from the trailers, but you spend a lot of time as Piccolo, Vegeta, a smidge as Future Trunks, and most of the time you're Gohan. Each chapter is separated by a few fights with bits of exploration and side quests you can do, a majority of which are time limited for that chapter. So if you miss a sub story here and there, you'll have to wait until you're done with the entire game to give it a shot via chapter select, a feature that apparently wasn't in the base game. So the side quests, or sub stories. They're a mixed bag. There's a lot of cute sub stories with characters that don't get enough screen time. Peel off, launch, Poir, Oolong. Dragon Ball and Z and everything else have lots of gaps in the story where characters would more than likely be hanging out and chatting, and Kakarot wants to fill those in. All in all, there's around 90 of these, most of which are at least slightly amusing. Or, you know, just helping all Roshi find his dirty magazines. More on that later, but they do in fact exist. Once you get through a few tutorial-like areas, Kakarot begins to open up quite a bit. Gohan gains the ability to fly, and the world becomes a more open RPG-like thing, and it's 
almost a bit overwhelming with how many systems you get. There's general RPG leveling, collectible items and gifts, huge skill trees that are more grindy and progression based than decision based, training grounds to learn new abilities, more hidden items around the maps including Z coins which are also needed to learn those attacks, grinding spots not just for experience points but fishing and item collection, random NPCs calling out hints and other tidbits, red ribbon army towers and Frieza force invasions happening at random, then there's villainous enemies spawning in 30 levels higher than you, not to mention we've got the community board which allows you to collect and place characters next to each other in order to gain passive bonuses on all your stats and like it's a lot, like a lot. That's a ton of systems for any game but Kakarot throws all of that at you right off the bat and then you know more of course, of course there's more. The orbs aren't much of a big deal since you'll be collecting those in combat and flying around in circles for fun like Superman 64 but it's a surprising amount of micromanaging you have to do for a game based on Dragon Ball Z. Good gameplay is like the most important part of a Dragon Ball Z game considering they've just been treading the same exact story for about 30 years now. CyberConnect is generally a tad weaker in this aspect so let's see if they nailed it this time. Just like in the show and manga, combat really escalates the further you get in. Despite being an action RPG, the only RPG you'll be seeing in fights is the number that displays when you punch dudes. A number that starts in the double digits that'll escalate all the way to literal millions of damage per hit. But the combos you get and the special attacks you unlock definitely feel more powerful. Not just in the number, but you'll, f you'll feel it. When you go through training to unlock moves, you can then assign it to one of your slots for a max of four attacks. Generally, you only have 5 or 6 viable moves to pick from with upgraded versions of them filling the gaps and that makes things manageable. You also got a ton of healing and buff items that you can use similarly. So the control scheme is simple, you got one melee attack button, one key blast button, triangle to charge up and cross to do an air step. You can combo things out of the melee attack, but generally you're fine mashing whatever combination of buttons you need. You can do an energy burst out of your combos, or if you're getting comboed, you can do a vanish attack at the expense of a ton of ki. In your base forms, Goku or whoever you're controlling have a very manageable melee combo visually, but as you get stronger and unlock the various Super Saiyan forms, that'll get more ridiculous. Anything can be comboed into a special attack, and generally it feels pretty fluid. That is unless you get smacked around mid-combo and are stunned, which which happens more than you would like. Especially because you just sit there taking whatever your opponent dishes out and it's like two seconds. Should you dodge? Yes. I don't have a follow up for that. However, this combat is pretty easy to exploit. Generally, you're okay avoiding most attacks by just spamming the quick step button over and over. Or you know, you can learn the infinite combo. Thank god this is a single player game. Now the forms are cool, they're all stances that you have to activate that drain your key meter gradually which is also used for your special attacks. So you have to make sure your charge charging up occasionally or doing key enhancing combos mid fight in order to maintain whatever form you're in. But like the show, you'll get stronger, go down that skill tree and unlock abilities that'll not only auto throw you into whatever form, but allow you to stay in it without draining key. <laughs> That's pretty useful considering it, you know, gives you like 150% multipliers on everything you do. Essentially, number go up. The combat as a whole is very simple, but it does feel fun to play, at least for the first 10 hours or so. While you're unlocking more moves and characters to do stuff with as the game goes on, they all feel virtually the same, with Vegeta being objectively the best because of Big Bang Attack. Seriously, he can just blow up everything on the screen at once. No targets necessary, it's fine. But with the addition of party members, gives you an actual party that you can create and assists that you can use. The five main playable characters can use their attacks on a cooldown while there's a handful of support characters that you can't control but you can throw in your party with more RPG-like functions. For example, Krillin and Tien have Solar Flare, which will stun your enemies for a brief period. I, uh, hardly thought about this. Mostly because why would anyone want to use Chiaotzu when they can just use Piccolo? Who who out there is a Chiaotzu stand? Does that exist? Finally, there's Z combos, which are cutscene attacks with your party that'll smack dudes up for a bunch of damage. It's nothing too special besides cool animations and like maybe a health bar. Fights themselves are fun to watch though. When you're in the more important fights, there's a lot of cool cyber connect flourishes to give everything some impact. You can hit dudes through giant pillars as well as activate mini cutscenes during fights that 
really bring out the ridiculousness of what's happening. Like sure, maybe your brain has normalized people flying around and shooting energy beams out of their palms, but when you get someone in a stun, do a full combo, and get a cutscene like this, that stays in your brain, that looks cool. Not to mention super finishes. Don't mind me, just uh, casually shooting a beacon of light through the galaxy. The insanity and spectacle of Dragon Ball Z is really captured in the combat system. It just kind of drags on you after a while because the majority of the AI fights are nearly identical. You just smack them a bunch, dodge their super attack, and smack them more. Or you can accidentally just outlevel everything, making huge boss fights a total joke. Sorry, I'm thorough and did every quest game. I didn't mean it. So combat's fine, but let's talk about the world, probably the part that most people were excited for. You know, we've seen the story a dozen times, we've played this type of game a dozen times, but what's it like living in Grand Theft Goku? <laughs> Child's play, as expected with someone with my skill. Oh, so it's perfect. Kakarot offers a lot to do. If you just zip line through the game, doing the story fights and skipping every cutscene, you'll blast it down in about 10 hours or so. If you're shooting for the 100% trophy completion, it'll take you about 40 hours or 20 to 25 with skipping cutscenes. <laughs> yeah, there's over 15 hours of cinematics in this game. If you go around the world looking for every Z coin, every quest, maxing out everything you can possibly find, it'll be closer to 60 to 70 hours, and that's without DLC. This game is extremely extremely thick, and there's so much for the player to do. The world is separated by zones, and you're able to travel between them very easily depending on where you are in the game. Some places are only accessible during certain chapters, and some points in the game are super railroaded, so you won't be able to do anything except what the game wants you to do right then. Which means no, you're not going to be accepting any cooking challenges right after Gohan gets yoinked. Speaking of cooking, there's some fun RPG stuff you can do here. At certain points in the game, you're able to talk to Chi Chi, and she can make big feasts for you complete with an old school anime eating montage. This will get you permanent stat upgrades and temporary buffs, but you'll need ingredients, which means you'll be hunting animals and blowing up giant dinosaurs. You can also go fishing, which normal people do with rods, but Goku does with uh, this thing Bulma made. I see. Sub stories make up a bulk of the side content, and despite them all feeling virtually the same to play, they all have some fun and interesting moments. I mean, who doesn't like following washed up Yamcha? Just like Toriyama said, they do add a lot of stories that you don't see in the manga or anywhere else, but a lot of them don't pack a punch. This does get better in the DLC, but we'll get to that later. Other than that, you'll be zooming around using your key senses to find random bits of currency or doing little mini games, the biggest of course being time trial races. At a certain point after the Frieza saga, you do actually get to do the driver's license episode. And once you thoroughly scar the driver's ed teachers, you get access to vehicle development with Bulma. You look around the map to find parts to create and upgrade a car and a jumping vehicle that controls similarly to Jumping Flash of all things. Finally, the sequel everyone wants. The car doesn't control perfectly, it's a little, uh, a little stiff, but the time trials are fun and they have a little neat character moment where the number one time to beat on each course is launch. Only Cyber Connect remembers launch. The other big minigame comes in when you get to the Gohan High School arc where you can do a home run derby. One where you have the ability to launch baseballs into orbit. That that's a that's a lot of miles. At a certain point, you actually gain access to the Dragon Balls, which you have to run around and collect in order to make wishes happen. These are mostly for unlocking certain sub-stories where for some reason you decide to revive some of the worst and most evil people in the story just to spar with them. Goku is a freaking idiot. Lastly, and yes, there is one more thing, is the community board. At certain points in the game, and by doing sub-stories, you'll unlock soul emblems, which are little cards for each of the characters in the universe. Each of these characters has stats and an affection meter, which can be leveled up by giving them gifts. Then they're arranged on separate grids, each of which give bonus stuff, increased experience points, bonus attack percentages, and just about everything. But each emblem has linkable bonuses depending on who they're next to, so maxing up each grid becomes a minigame in itself. And well, I did exactly that. How long did it take? Don't worry about it. Oh, and I guess uh, the game will let you fly. It's pretty freaking sick. There's a handful of Easter eggs hidden around in the world, but most of the time you'll be flying by stuff so quickly that you're not gonna notice. But take a second to pause and you'll see some of the small stuff. But that's partially because Dragon Ball is a series of big moments or sagas, you know, the Saiyan invasion, the excursion to Namek. There's all these big moments that happened and there's not much time to smell the roses. So what's cool and what I think everyone was looking forward to was that opportunity, especially with what Akira Toriyama said. But weirdly, Kakarot's a little picky about it. 
I'm genuinely surprised they didn't try to stick more filler in here. There's a lot of time skips where there could have been several fun new maps and places to explore. A majority of this game takes place on Earth and the planets of the Kais with a brief trip to Namek and the quality of everything takes a big dip there, especially a Namek. Doesn't look great. Not only is there so much to do here, but visually it looks a full step down. Kakarot is really front loaded with its effort, storytelling, and variety. But then instead of giving us a snake way to traverse like the legacy see a Goku game, so it skips right over all of that, which is weird considering they advertised the game as Kakarot, telling the story of one Goku. There's no Garlic Jr. filler arc, we don't get to play as Goku on Yardrad where he learned instant transmission, there's no Otherworld tournament arc, and there's not a single one of the movies covered. Well, that's all fine, I feel like there's a huge missed opportunity with this. They could have easily thrown everyone's favorite Goku, Turles, into a side quest or even time capsule mission, but there's no trace of any of that. No Broly, just strictly canon stuff and whatever they added with the sub stories. I feel like they threw the player more time consuming systems when they could have easily given us more areas, characters, and stories to experience. Heck, despite showing up for the world tournament right before the Majin stuff, there's not a single second of that tournament included. It just skips right into Best Girl Verdell getting beat up. The saddest part of the entire show, thanks. Then suddenly we're in Bobbity's reverse Red Ribbon Army Tower and it just feels disjointed. Though we do get a quest where Krillin asks Andrew 18 out on a date. Or the one where you have to bring old Kaya kiss from somebody else's wife. The absolute nerve. There's a lot of weird small stuff like this that might make up for it, but it still feels a little lacking. Starting with the Cell games, everything feels railroaded to an extent where it feels less like an RPG with exploration and more like a standard Dragon Ball Z video game, which really takes away Kakarot's identity. Remember when Trunks and Vegeta got really big? Like huge. That entire segment is skipped. No Ultra Super Saiyan here today. <laughs> When you show up to fight the androids, Yamcha's already, like, dead, I guess. In fact, there's a warning before you enter the tournament grounds at the end that, quote, you will not be able to do anything else until you beat the game. <laughs> That's several hours of fights and cutscenes. I mean, I guess it makes sense, considering Boo kills the entire population of the planet. It definitely feels disjointed, though. Like, potentially, they ran out of time or budget, which makes sense when we get to the DLC. Any licensed video game's narrative can only be as good as its source material, and the back half of Kakarot leaves a bit to be desired. Still, there's a lot of post-game content, and watching those final cutscenes of the Super Genki Dama gets you pretty good. But at this point, the combat system just wasn't enough to hold its own, and it becomes a mash fest where the numbers don't really matter because every fight starts giving you like two to three level ups. At least, this game doesn't end with Goku running off with some random child. Something about Boo being reborn as Oob because of Boodism. I'm uh, moving on. However, they did decide to give us one final boss fight by the coolest possible means. You got Goku and Kid Buu going at it and he's about to throw the spirit bomb when time just freezes. The massive ball of energy is floating in the sky and Chala Head Chala is playing in the background. It's uh, it was pretty sick. But when you finish the final fight, you're thrown into the open world where there's a few more post-game sub-stories you can do, including reviving Deborah because of course Goku would. Though the quest dialogue is great because he's like, I was so excited to go to hell and then they sent me to heaven and now I'm a changed man. Good for you, buddy. Good for you. And at least for the base game, that's about all she wrote. There's grinding you can do with not Android 21 being thrown into Bulma's lab, tons of coins to collect, there's a series of more powerful enemies you can fight called Villainous Foes, featuring universe traveling badass Mira, who I don't really know much about, but apparently he was in Dragon Ball Online and Xenoverse 1 and 2. But again, this is just fighting the same dudes until you're a high enough level. So all in all, base Dragon Ball Z Kakarot is probably exactly a 7 out of 10. I don't think it's a bad game, but it could have been so much more. So now, almost two years after its initial release, there is a lot more to talk about with all of the DLC, so let's talk about it. Considering this is a game made in the 2020s, there is, of course, a season pass. The one thing that makes this specific one interesting, though, is that it seems like a majority of what was in it was conceived, developed, and released during the bad times. Good old COVID. That, in turn, led to huge gaps in time between the releases of content. Generally, it seems like the first piece of a season pass comes out two to three months after the initial release, and A New Power Awakens Part 1 ended up coming out in April, with Part 2 all the way out in November, 10 full months months after the game's release. And these are pretty underwhelming. A New Power Awakens Part 1 is a DLC that can be played at any point in the game that gives one thing, the ability to grind. 
Goku and Vegeta are yoinked over to Beerus's planet where he and Whis just offer to train the boys. And uh, that's it. It's a non-canon version of the events from Super that tosses you what's essentially a free grind button with free XP increasing items as well. A consumable that grants XP which you'll need. Now when you beat the game, you're more than likely to be around level 60 to 70 depending on how much playing you did. That's like what, 40 to 50 hours of game time? Then in about two hours in this mode, I hit the level cap of 250 with both characters. <laughs> Alrighty then. Now I love Beerus and Whis. They're some of the coolest new characters Toriyama's made, let alone in the entire franchise. But this DLC was literally created as a number treadmill where you fight Whis over and over until you can fight Beerus a few times. You can even skip story moments and unlock the ability to go Super Saiyan earlier in the main game. If you've already done that though, Goku's like, yeah, I can already do that. And Whis is like, oh. My bad. It seems like a hastily thrown together piece of content, and while Beerus's planet and Super Saiyan God look great visually, it's lacking, well, things to do. There's a few sub stories you can do, and while it's always funny watching Vegeta piss himself around Beerus, it doesn't add anything of substance. So the first piece of DLC is a big old miss unless you only want to use it to grind levels. Exciting, I know. DLC 2, A New Power Awakens, part two. Now I know you're probably thinking like, hey, uh, this is probably just more of the same, isn't it? And it kind of is and kind of isn't. April to November would be a seven month gap, which is pretty large for a single player game season pass. During the summer, a ton of fans began to get riled up wondering what the status of the content was. Even news publications were asking the question, where it at, where it be? It's pretty easy to come to the conclusion that this gap was due to COVID related work issues, but also both CyberConnect and Bandai Namco failed to make a single statement regarding any of this. They had dropped details in August, 2020, and then suddenly dropped a trailer like a week and a half before the DLC launched. So November 16th, 2020, A New Power Awakens Part 2 drops. It covers the battle against Frieza in the Resurrection F movie. There's another 50 level increase with more battles against Whis, more XP items. There's a new type of random battle you can do and really it's just more of the same. However, it does follow the plot of the movie, so we get some new super high quality cutscenes. So for those who haven't seen the second Frieza saga, big spoilers, he comes back to Earth, can go gold now, and wants to get revenge. Goku and Vegeta can go blue now though, then they're too cocky, Frieza's like nah, Earth's gone now, and Goku's like oh shit. Whis is like, don't worry, I got this though. Goku's like, cool, kills Frieza, and the day is saved. Then, because this is a video game, there's a sub-story where Goku befriends this ex frieza Force dude trying to resurrect the F, who decides he shouldn't because he loves babes and food on Earth. But then Goku's all like, hmm, we got Dragon Balls. I should resurrect Frieza so I can have them as a training partner. And it made me very upset. Goku is the worst father and the dumbest man in the universe. But you already knew that. Gameplay-wise, there's a new battle called Horde Mode, where you have to defeat an absurd amount of dudes similarly to the movie. You can charge up your Z-Team attacks to take out like 200 at a time and it's a pretty cool visual. Although once you're a high enough level, you can just mash the attack button for like five minutes straight without paying attention and walk out with enough experience points to have your entire party dinging faster than a level skip in an MMO. A very specific reference. Once again, we've got some pretty underwhelming DLC. The newly animated top tier cutscenes were a nice addition as is the inclusion of Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan or whatever we're calling it, but it distills itself down into a way to grind as fast as part one did, making this feel more like content than a chapter in the grand RPG saga following Son Goku. And so ends the tale of Goku. Now CyberConnect covered his journey from Dragon Ball Z to a little bit into Super and that's pretty much all we're gonna get out of him. So we are done talking about Goku, but we're not done talking about this game. There's one more huge piece of DLC to talk about, but first in October 2020, just a little bit before New Power Awakens Part 2 came out, there was a free update with a card game. Yep. Dragon Ball Card Warriors. A month prior to part two, CyberConnect essentially shadow dropped an entire new mode into Kakarot, a trading card game, a TCG. Now there's collectible cards in Kakarot that you can find and unlock by maxing out soul emblems that you can see in the gallery, but they decided to then take those, add hundreds more and make a standalone TCG you can not just play by yourself, but online with rankings. Not just that, there's seasons, there's updates adjusting card attack and health value, 
values, there's standalone microtransactions. For anyone who knows, there's already like three or four different TCGs featuring Dragon Ball Z in existence. There's the original American one from the 90s that I had too many of. There's Dragon Ball Super Card Game, which is the most recent and popular one. There's Dragon Ball Heroes, a really popular Japanese arcade game that prints physical cards and has you doing ridiculous QTEs in the middle of it. A Switch console version of this was literally the last Dragon Ball Z game that got released prior to Kakarot, which also came with physical cards for Super. Never mind older ones like Cardass. But yeah, they freaking made up their own card game specifically to throw into Kakarot. It's not available on mobile. You can't even access it without the main game, but it does have microtransactions and it's been updated as recently as July. Who knows how long this will be supported, but it's definitely an extremely weird and random addition to a game that's already got a stupid amount of content. It's also a pretty decent card game, though that, that's kind of hard to mess up. Unless you add pendulums. Dang it, Yugi. So finally, we're stumbling upon the last piece of DLC in the season pass, and the last thing we're gonna be talking about in this video. Now, when CyberConnect announced the season pass, they didn't tell anybody what they were doing outright, but I sure am glad that they picked my favorite part of Dragon Ball Z to cover. All the way in June 2021, eight months after the last DLC and 18 months after the game come out would be the last piece of DLC. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot Trunks, the Warrior of Hope. Unlike previous pieces of DLC, Trunks the Warrior of Hope is entirely standalone. It follows the history of Trunks OVA as everyone's favorite, Future Trunks, and the awful future he lives in prior to coming to the past. This emotional story has always been an impactful one, but CyberConnect really outdid themselves on this content. It feels closer to Legacy of Goku or a normal RPG than the entire Kakarot game. It's jam-packed with smaller things to do, it's even got more what-ifs than you would expect. So you play as a young Future Trunks and his teacher, Future Gohan, and these two work really well. That original mini-movie is only like 40 minutes long, so when you play through this DLC with its runtime closer to 5 or 6 hours, you get quite a bit more depth out of their relationship and the world that Trunks has to live in. He can't fly around freely at first because there's red ribbon army drones trying to find humanity. West City is completely in ruins and you live in an underground area with Bulma. You get to explore the relationships that Trunks and Gohan have with survivors like Chi Chi and Master Rose while also getting those hard-hitting moments. And knowing CyberConnect, those hard-hitting moments really hit. You can really tell that they were now fully comfortable with a lot of aspects of the game's engine. Almost every fight in the base game, regardless of whether or not you're supposed to win in story, ends with you beating the crap out of them. But here they put in multiple losing fights that you can't win. You have to escape, or in some cases, get knocked out. It's easily the best the story's ever been told, and it's a clear picture on Future Trunks' motives. But that's not all. Similar Similarly to Dragon Ball Super, Warrior of Hope goes into the what if scenario with Trunks and the possibility of Majin Buu. So sometime after Trunks comes back into his timeline and defeats the androids in Cell, Kibito and the Supreme Kai pop up and are like, hey, you gotta like, you gotta save the world again. Trunks, taking after his master Gohan, accepts without a second thought and realizes that he is at this point the protector of the world, the last hope. So now we've got this AU thing where Trunks is pulling out the Z sword, much easier and cleaner than Team Gohan by the way. He trains for a bit, but then Babidi and Deborah appear, so it's time to go. And because Trunks can never have anything good happen to him, Deborah kills Kibito and Supreme Kai in the middle of the fight, causing Trunks to achieve a brand new form, Super Saiyan 2, in a way that looks way cooler than the Super anime. The new cinematics they added showcasing the story are absolutely brilliant, and the mid-fight sequences are some of the very best that the entire Dragon Ball franchise has to offer. This entire side story shows us how much of a badass Trunks is, completely justifying all the fanfiction I read back in the day. Then after this sad set of events where Trunks continues to lose all of his friends while becoming a hardened defender of the realm, we get a few more side stories to complete. And of course, the final one's related to Oolong and the pair of panties he wishes for at the very beginning of the franchise. What do you think this is? Not anime. The Frieza Force is and will always be a joke. There's a really sentimental one where you check in on Chi Chi and the Ox King following Gohan's death, but there's also one where you stumble upon this guy who loved Android 18. This despondent man who's about to kill himself and he's like, I wish she killed me before she died. Well, better use Oolong. Yeah. 
She's gorgeous. So if I gave the main game a 7 out of 10, I would have to give this specific DLC legit like a 9. This is the kind of content I think we all wanted out of Kakarot. A lot of the fundamentals are the same, but this tight package filled with what-ifs and a progression that's less grind-dependent and more adventure-feeling kills it. You can tell CyberConnect was getting into a groove, and even though this took a year and a half to come out, it was well worth the wait. This DLC is awesome, and if you're a fan of Dragon Ball or Trunks, you should play it. And you should play it, if only for that one quest where Poir's running around telling everybody how great Yamcha is, even though he's dead. And then you, like, try to help, but then they're like, actually, you're way cooler than this guy. It's good stuff. Dragon Ball Z Kakarot feels like multiple games. It jumps around in quality. You can feel the COVID limitations as well as the budget restrictions. It is to me a total oddity that I think people should look at because people just kind of took it in one ear and out the other and you know now that it's been updated it's become a much different game that I think is a really cool full experience. There's two reasons I decided to tackle this game. Number one because I shamelessly love Dragon Ball but number two was because of that reception. If CyberConnect had the time and budget, I think they could have made this entire game the same quality as the Trunks DLC. Perhaps that's a ridiculous ask, but imagine that level with not just the entire Z Saga, but all the movies, the original Dragon Ball even. Something that continued to take the time to slow things down here and there, as opposed to railroading you into the end of the game. Kakarot is at its worst when it's non-stop battles, making every zone feel similar, like a normal Dragon Ball Z game. But when it slows you down and lets you check out NPCs, and zones, it feels so much cooler. Just imagine Snake Way. Snake Way would have been perfect. The brief Super Saiyan Man sequences were the bomb. The intermissions between chapters where you can relax a bit felt good. There's even small, silly character moments like everyone getting hyped about driving and highways. They just talk about the road all the time. It's a highway, huh? Kakarot is a game that swung for the fences, or in this case, outside of the Milky Way, but ultimately it falls a tiny bit short due to what I can only imagine is the curse of most licensed games. It wants to be Spider-Man, and I can see the potential in a lot of areas, but despite all of its unique qualities, lands firmly at that 7 out of 10. It's got a killer soundtrack that utilizes and remixes the original. Visually, it's incredible sometimes. The combat is fun, but drones on after a while, and it's the most any video game has felt like Dragon Ball Z. I think a tiny bit more time in the oven could have really pushed this up a whole notch or two, and I hope they give it another shot. Just not anytime soon. Dragon Ball needs a break. We can only do the entire saga of Dragon Ball so many times. CyberConnect just released the Demon Slayer game, and it seems like that's kind of on the same level as Naruto Ultimate Ninja games, so who knows if we'll see them come back to this big open world formula. I definitely think, though, that CC2 deserves to break away from licensed games. I would love to see a new IP from them. One that's not the depressing furry games that I love. Yeah. Oh, and guess what? Literally in the middle of making this video, they decided to release another free update where you could play as Gotenks and Vegito, and there's a couple new sub stories as well. And I know the free update comes out around the same time as like the Switch port did, but it's like, jeez, is this game gonna finish? When, when's the last update? And well, that's Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. The big question remains though, do I recommend it? And yeah, yeah, I think I do. Just know that the quality jumps around sometimes, it kind of feels disjointed from time to time, but honestly, just, just play the Trunks DLC. It's great. Anyways, I've been Austin, and I'm gonna go because the runtime on this is getting way too long. Catch me next time when I talk about a trio of games made by a publisher that you probably didn't expect. Also, I think I might open another P.O. box, so if you guys are interested in that, let me know in the comments, and I'm gonna go. Yeah, okay, bye. Thank you guys so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Blackfoot Ferret, Brandon Howe, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Darren Newton, DX Buster, David Molnar, GM Pinks, Irrational, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Karen Arder, Nick Irving, P Funk, Randall Bentley, and Ryan Talbert. Thank you all so much for your generous support. I finally did it. It only took me like this was a hundred hour project let's let's be real but i hope that you guys enjoyed it it was very fulfilling for me i'm gonna do more deep dives in the future so get ready for that new video next week as well hey we're gonna keep the, the ball rolling Hall, happy holidays and uh final fantasy and walker coming out soon my spelling my end also hey fourths of five it is 3 a.m right now <laughs>